Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. Uh, this is Christian Buckley, and as I do every great once in a while, I'm, I'm here without a guest uh, to share a topic that I care a lot about, uh, something that has a huge impact on a successful team or enterprise collaboration culture. And that is the topic of digital debt. Uh, specifically, I'd like to talk about harnessing AI because we're all talking about AI, right? Uh, but harnessing AI to reduce digital debt. And this is more of an essay. I've got all my bullet points you know, down in front of me kind of reading through and talking about each one of them um, rather than the back and forth with my guests. And for those that are new to the channel, uh, like I, I generally have like a framework of questions, a few things, like the bio, of course, of each of my guests. Um, but I prefer the discussions to be very organic based on, you know, the the topic that we agree uh, on and, and then just kind of explore that topic and based on what comes up in that, again, that natural organic conversation, I ask questions around it. And so I try to do that. It's my style of presenting anyway. Um, so I've got some prepared notes to, to go through some things that I'm going to read through, but I'm going to share some of my thoughts on the topic. Um, great place to start on this um, is around the state of collaboration within modern work. And of course, the way that we're working, the way that modern work is happening, it's rapidly changing. And digital tools are increasingly part of the way that more and more people are getting work done. It's used to be modern workplace, information workers would use the technology. And it's now just permeated like so many different roles. You go into a grocery store and they're, you know, they're up on the computer. You go to a repair shop, you go to anything. There's, you know, technology is a big part of the way that they work. So and as AI technology is artificial in intelligence, continues to advance, it is bringing new opportunities to enhance workplace productivity and innovation. How, however, it also brings challenges in the form of some digital debt. And so what is digital debt? Uh, I came across a great definition. I was uh, kind of writing something down, but I came across a definition um, by our friends at Insight, very large uh, consulting partner out there, which they state digital debt is when knowledge workers are overburdened, keyword there, by our friends, uh, the overburdened by the need to address, process, and respond to emails, instant messages, application notifications, and other data. Digital debt is the result of growing workloads and the increasing pace of work expectations. Employees don't have enough time and energy to effectively address all the new information that grows each day, putting them in digital debt. Having too many ongoing projects, large teams, ineffective meetings, and more can increase digital debt. Unchecked digital debt can harm productivity that drives innovation and growth by taking away an employee's time to focus on completing tasks and experiencing deep work. Great. And I'll provide the link in the blog post around this. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, article on that. And for so for this episode, um, it, it just the, it came up in topic and conversations a couple times this week around this. And I thought, you know, I've, I've written on this topic before. I'll share a link and I'll show show you an article specifically on this topic. Uh, but I thought this is this is huge. I'd like to explore it because digital debt in the workplace it it impacts just about everything that we do. It impacts the innovation that organizations do. How employees can leverage AI, however, is a great way to reduce that digital debt. And the concept of AI aptitude is becoming really critical. Um, making sure that people, you may not understand all of the ways that you can use the technology. It's less obvious. Like usually you you buy a, a, a platform, a tool, a solution, and has a series of features. You understand what that is in the ROI. With a lot of these uh, uh, AI solutions, we don't yet fully understand. It's not quite that simple of the benefits that we'll get out of using these tools. And so I think 
as time goes on, we're going to see more and more case studies and examples, um, ROI statements of leveraging these tools. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the negative effects of uh, digitization in the workplace and on employment specifically. Uh, so going back to the definition, uh, digital debt refers to the accumulation of work that is created as a result of using digital tools and technology. So this includes uh, the multiple applications that we're using from your office suite, um, productivity tools, collaboration technologies like Microsoft Teams or Slack or SharePoint or all of these various tools that are out there, um, Jira, um, you know, other DevOps type tools that are out there. Dealing then with all of the software updates, the desktop updates, updates of your mobile devices, syncing between the various devices. And then of course, if you're out on the road occasionally like I am, making sure that you're syncing back and forth with all these different tools. And there's a lot of that handling of data and communications and we're getting overloaded by that. And we're constantly having to learn new technologies. We can't sit still. Things are changing so quickly uh, and that's why people are feeling so overwhelmed. So digital debt can negatively impact productivity by consuming employees' times and mental resources, leaving them with less time and energy to focus on innovative tasks and problem solving. And and great way to think about this too. And there's been a lot of studies out there on this topic, but think about how much time that it takes for you to switch between tasks or between applications and get your mind to really focus on that net new task. Um, there's been these studies that have been done that uh, of the impact of multitasking, for example, uh, or as I like to call it, the, the lie of multitasking, because we can't, we're not built that way. Uh, you, you know, people that, uh, you know, like I, I used to consider myself really good at moving back and forth between tasks. It's something that actually attracted me to the project management space. I was a business analyst and project manager and a technical writer. And to be able to move between the different applications and support these complex systems while doing project management, while going out and doing customer engagement and management and adoption trainings and all those different things. I loved having all of the, the moving pieces, but the reality is that it took a toll. Uh, it's, it's difficult to sustain that level of energy um, because it is, it's that digital debt. Um, so that, that's where digital debt can be most visible in our brains as we struggle to keep up with the pace of change and the switch between these activities. So a lot of this content is available. If you're not familiar with it, uh, Microsoft has their Work Lab blog, and I'll I'll share that. I I love this site when it went live. Uh, you know, a lot of the last few years, a lot of discussion around managing the employee experience, and of course that just became a huge topic of discussion during the pandemic. When I think everybody started to understand that this is not sustainable. People are burning out. Um, and, and and so Microsoft launched this uh, this site. Of course, they launched a a new brand around employee experience, which is the Microsoft Viva um, set of solution. So they are they are um, really a collection of of things that may not seem like they work right together, but that address different aspects of that employee experience. That uh, you know the the a lot of the HR and communications topics, for example. Um, but if you're not familiar with this site, um, you can find it, of course, at microsoft.com slash en dash us work lab. Of course, you can just go and search for Microsoft Work Lab and find it. I'll have a link in the blog post. Um, but definitely, this is something that you want to bookmark and make it part of your regular reading. One of the things I love about this, and yes, there's a lot of AI on the front page here as you scroll down through, and there is a newsletter. There's various guides that walk through for different roles around AI, because that's a lot of what Microsoft is focusing on right now. But if you go up to the top, you actually have the drop down for work lab, leadership, culture, innovation, collaboration, performance, and well-being, the employee well-being. Uh, it is just a great site. But what's a couple other things that are cool here. This is where Microsoft hosts their work trend index. I'll mention that here in a moment. Um, so their annual report where they go in and look at how people are working and the data around it. Um, but in general, what's great about this site is Microsoft uh, 
provides a lot of data and storytelling around around the data of why they're building, why they made decisions around certain products, what how they're doing what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing. And so it's fantastic to go in and see some of the behind the scenes, the thinking around your favorite products and, and solutions. Um, so again, I would personally recommend bookmarking that, making it part of your regular reading. Um, so the site, of course, is as you saw, it explores topics around AI and employee experience and product development, um, sharing a lot of that data. Um, so definitely go check it out. Now, talking specifically about the work in index, a trend index report, the average organization and information worker face a significant, significant cost uh, to innovation due to digital debt. So they talk about that at length. Uh, the report states that the average worker spends more than 60% of their time on work about work. So not even getting work done, they're, it's, it's working on stuff to get ready for work. And I think about this as, um, you know, meetings and, and tasks around that activity um, to track things, to measure things. And that's the way they look at it too. They, they, they say work about work, meaning that much of their workday is spent on tasks related to managing digital tools and communications rather than on innovation or creative pursuits. This can stifle innovation as employees are left with limited time and energy to think critically and creatively uh, around about their work. And a great way to think about this too is, um, well, so I've been working remotely for about 15 years now. And uh, in that time, like I, one of the things I uh, find myself saying to my wife is, is that, you know, I'll have a long day of meetings and I'll go upstairs because my office is here in the basement uh, and say, okay, I, I've had the eight hours of solid meetings. And she's like, oh, great, you're done. Like, no, now, now I need to go get work done. And then I will spend the next uh, two or three hours, not every day, but sometimes going through and catching up on actually getting the execution done of the, you know, the work that needs to be done, sometimes just enough to get ready for the next day. Um, so I definitely feel the burnout from that. So to maximize productivity and innovation in the workplace, employees can are starting to leverage AI, so artificial intelligence to help manage this digital debt. So AI can be used to automate repetitive tasks, streamline workflows, and provide insights for better decision making. We've we've all seen the marketing. We've been just uh, you know pummeled with it over the last year. Um, but the reality is, by harnessing the power of AI. Uh, employees can spend more time on creative and strategic tasks and less time on work about work. So where you start to identify patterns in the things that you do, that's where you can go and automate and, and extend yourself using AI. So some ways that employees can leverage AI include, uh, for example, adopting AI power tools to automate routine tasks. Just what I said. There's pre-built solutions that are out there. Uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, you have uh, it's all the rage right now to go out there and build um, your know, workflows, power automates, uh, uh, power apps, power pages, um, to build dashboards uh, and uh, and reports and other things to set up automation so that you're getting notified when certain things happen. So you're not having to go dig through a report or look at a dashboard to find out if did something happen in my environment that I need to go take an action on. You can automate so that it alerts you. It can automate too if it's a standard uh, alert where uh, uh, you know something that a repetitive action that your end users are taking, I don't need to go take an action because it will automatically go and service those users. Um, two, utilizing AI for data analysis and insights to inform decision-making. One of my favorite things, uh, and there's actually kind of a joke. I don't have it live in front of me. I guess I can stop sharing this this page. Um, but there's a great meme, a joke out there of uh, there was a, a manager standing behind a, a, a person sitting at a desk in front of a computer saying, isn't this great? I can um, take these three bulleted items um, of the main points I want to make and using AI, it'll cr craft this great narrative and create a page long you know, story to walk through the three bullets. And on the other side of the screen 
it's the manager sitting behind another person sitting at the desk and the other person's reading says, isn't this great? AI can take this long drawn out message and can uh, and, and move it down to condense it, summarize it down into three bullets so I can easily consume. So are we digging a hole and filling it? Like, I don't like to think of it in that way. Um, I, I, I do love the, the going and looking at complex data sets, looking at long documents or reports, long emails, which are, um, look, we, I'm a writer. We can always write shorter, more concise emails. Um, but to go in and look at um, all of the emails coming in to follow a conversation and for AI to go in and say, here are the pertinent facts here are the requests, the asks of you. Here's the actions you need to take today, um, over the next week, um, so that you can prioritize your work, your activities, and again, the the uh, you know summarize complex data, and then it can you know leveraging AI to enhance communication and collaboration. And there's things here like, um, and I often do that where I write very short, um, to the point, sometimes very terse emails that don't convey the emotion or show show any empathy for a situation or, or whatever. So I'm I'm starting to leverage not big, long, flowery emails, but around communications. I said, I, I need to communicate these three bullets um, uh, to this team. I want it to be a professional, but, uh, you know, but lighthearted uh, uh, response to these things. And I'll start to leverage it for those ty ty types of communications. For a lot of marketing, it's fantastic. Like to go and where I've written a detailed article, I'll leverage AI to go in and give me suggestions for uh, for social posts, for tweets, for LinkedIn, longer LinkedIn messagings, for Facebook posts to help me promote that content. And it is fantastic for that A-B testing on messaging as well, where I can say, look, I really want to focus on these themes generate some different tweets, some different posts uh, around the same content. It is fantastic for that. What I would sit there and as a, as a, I mean, my degrees are in marketing and I've been in tech for 30 years, but I'm a marketing guy and I hate sitting and trying to be creative and writing these short pieces. So leveraging AI to go and do that is just fantastic. The hard part about all of this is that we do need to uh, constantly increase our AI aptitude. Um, and that refers to an individual's ability to understand and effectively use AI technologies in their work. So it's not just about understanding, you know, basically how the products work. It's, uh, it's about, and this is a big part of the whole digital transformation. People made the mistake of thinking, well, digital transformation in my organization means that we're just on the latest version of all of the software, of all the tools that we had. No. Digital transformation, you can have old technology, old software. It's about, are we optimized for what we're trying to do as a business? So similarly for this, you need to have that, uh, um, to really utilize AI, you need to understand how it works and how the tools, where, where can you get the biggest bang for the buck? Where can you optimize for your activities? And so part of that is, you have to pay attention to what's new, what's coming out. Part of the reason for that is things are changing so quickly. Um, but you need to, one, develop a foundational understanding of AI, including its capabilities and limitations. I always tell people, like, you, you need to know how to train the AI. You need to know where the data is that it's drawing from, whether it's public or private. Um, things like Microsoft Copilot, where it's learning from your email, from your content. Um, and, and using something like Microsoft Teams and it's following those conversations. Now that it's frustrated by some of it, I'm having to go through additional steps where I want it to pull information from multiple meetings, from multiple location, locations. And so there's some additional work because I understand how Copilot in Teams is pulling its information versus going and gathering all the data that I'd like to teach it on um, and to to have it ingest and then get more insights out of this collective data versus one meeting, one document at a time. Um, so it's you it's important to understand how the tools work fundamentally so that you're getting the most out of them. 
Um, you need to learn how AI can be applied to specific job functions. And this is where you need to be paying attention to what's happening in the community and specifically around similar roles. Like I've always been a huge advocate for internal user groups, uh, for brown bag sessions on Fridays where employees are sharing, here's what I built. It's not done. It's not perfect, but here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what I was trying to do. Here's what I've built and have those conversations because inevitably in those conversations, your coworkers are going to say, Hey, I was trying to build something similar. I did it differently. This is what I got. And so you'll, you'll come up with something better by working together. So the more mind share you have involved with it, the, the more that we'll all learn from each other and work together. And it'll be more uh, you know, relevant to our shared work activities if we're having those conversations and working together. Um, but we need to, to look at outside industry wide, like what's happening out there, even going, joining uh, your know, communities, forums, and participating in conversations around your role. If you're in HR, for example, if you're in healthcare, those are two areas. I mean, it's happening. There's a lot going on in a lot of areas, but those are two hotspots around AI where there's so many obvious use cases in HR and in healthcare um, to leverage the mass amounts of data and solve specific problems. So be aware of user groups, of forums, of, of you know, LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups, where uh, Reddit communities, where these conversations are happening around people that have similar jobs. And then the third thing, engage in continuous learning and professional development to stay up to date with the latest AI advancements and best practices. Yeah, so that's something where um, if you are working for one of those companies where they a certain amount of your time is allotted for training, make sure you're taking advantage of that time and you're constantly learning. Doesn't mean you need to go out and become the expert in those things, but there is something to be said about going and playing with, trialing different technologies just to understand, you know, the latest, greatest, how do these things work? Like I would highly recommend if you've not already done so to go and sign up for something like ChatGPT and, you know, just for your personal use, play with it to understand how do I get the most out of this? Uh, many people have said like in the future, how important prompt engineering is. Um, I just saw a question where somebody was struggling that they recorded a meeting. Uh, they talked to co-pilot uh, about the, the meeting and it basically just summarized, you know, what was said within the meeting. And there's like, well, like that, that's dumb. I want to know more about it. It was like, well, what other questions did you ask it? So your, your uh, ability to ask the right questions will help you get better insights, better data back out of the AI. Um, despite its potential benefits, um, the, the digitalization can also have negative effects on the workplace. So some of the negative effects of all of this rapid transformation uh, is that we have increased stress and burnout due to information overload and the constant need to stay connected. That's a real thing. You need to be careful of that. I mean, I like I will do things where I will, like on the weekends, I put my phone down. Obviously I go out to the store or something. I take my phone with me, but I'm around the house. Like my phone is sitting at the charger at my desk. I'm up stairs doing whatever for the, for the whole day. Um, usually grab my phone because I want to take the dog for a walk and I want to play some music and listen on my, or listen to a podcast while I'm walking the dog. I'm not doing work, stressing about those other things. Not always. I'm, I'm always writing something. There's always some project going on. Um, but be careful with how connected you think you need to be to everything. Um, you'll burnout will happen faster if you don't learn to pace yourself um, to separate home and work life. Um, second problem: reduced human interaction, leading to feelings of isolation and decreased opportunities for collaboration and relationship building. This is a serious problem. Um, if you've been paying attention to the interwebs the last uh, a couple months, there's been just the, a lot of uh, TikToks and Instagram uh, videos and YouTube videos of a younger generation. Um, I'm, I'm in the, the middle age category, um, but who are struggling with, um, uh, with loneliness, with, you know, they're, they're not feeling connected to their fellow humans. And a lot of it's because we've invested so much time and screens 
uh, into this entertainment, into the digital world that we, a lot of younger people have forgotten what it's like to go out and actually have conversations. Uh, and so uh, that's, again, one of those things where we, like, we did it for our kids as, as they were growing up, my kids were all born uh, three in the nineties, one in 2000. Uh, and as they were growing up, being very careful about their screen time, whether it's TV time, computer time, or when they got a little bit older, phone time. Um, and those were my oldest two, like there weren't really cell phones that were common um, when they were both born. Anyway, that all changed rapidly. Um, so that's something that we need to self-regulate around those things. It makes a difference. Um, I know that um, there, I've worked in organizations where teams where managers are like, hey, there are no laptops. There's no technology in this meeting. We want to have a conversation. Now, of course, with the benefit of AI, you can be in there um, capturing, you know, digitally through Teams or some other method, recording, capturing, transcripting that meeting. You can be 100% present sitting there interacting and the technology is capturing all of that and the takeaways and the assignments. Somebody says, hey, Christian, I want you to go and do this task. Like it now picks that up and can send reminders, a summary of what was discussed. Here are the takeaways. Christian, here's what was assigned to you during this meeting. And so it's getting better, again, that we're not having that overload where we can participate actively in the conversation and have the technology pick up the, the action items. And then again, the third uh, effect of the need for continuous learning and adaptation, which can be time consuming and challenging for some employees. That's one of the biggest factors here is uh, so many people are feeling uh, overworked already. Now it's something else I need to go learn about. The reality is that to, to be able to go and automate, to streamline, to simplify, it's going to take a little bit above and beyond what you're doing in your regular job. It's It'll take some effort to understand what needs to be done, how you can improve things before you can actually spend the time and improve things. Um, so hopefully you work for an organization where they understand, like you need to take some things off people's plates. We need to spread things around a bit more so people have the opportunity um, to go in and look at the way that they're working and automate and streamline. Um, digitalization has also led to concerns about job displacement and unemployment as automation and AI technologies can potentially replace human labor. However, Microsoft's optimistic view of AI sees technology as a means to an end to end the drudgery of that digital debt rather than replacing human workers entirely. As Microsoft President Brad Smith puts it, we need to use AI not to replace people but to give them back the one thing that they don't have enough of today, and that's time. And that's that's really the, the, the key here. Um, I remember uh, was at a pub in Helsinki, Finland, after I flew over and presented to a user group and met with some clients years ago. And, and afterwards uh, was having a, an argument with a, a younger guy who was talking about um, AI and um, and wow, this was, it's like 12 to 14 years ago. Um, but he had some ideas about how, when, uh, when AI was in place and we were talking about robotics and different things too. And of course, uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, the Terminator movies in there and kind of the dystopian future view of all the technology. Um, but he said, no, I think it's going to be, you know, humans will be able to, um, basically sit back and let um, robots and AI do all the work and that humans that will just sit back and be able to just live their lives and enjoy and the, you know, and, and kind of live in luxury. And I, my response to him was like, wow, you don't know human nature at all. You don't understand like, no, that I don't see that as a future at all. Like they're, uh, you know, they're, they're all, well, you know, we can get into a deeper philosophical question about, you know, what will or won't happen um, with AI um, when, uh, you know, when they take over and our, our robot overlords uh, take control. Um, but uh, I, I don't see it as uh, as rosy cheeked as as he did, um, that it was just going to be that we're living in luxury, that, that it's going to improve a lot of things. But 
what I've learned is that the more that I am automate and streamline my tasks, um, the more I'm able to get help in those monotonous, you know, repeat areas that I don't have to do, or even pay somebody junior to come in and do like those tasks. It allows me to do more of the higher level activities to plan, be strategic, um, to to create thought leadership content, to to kind of go beyond you know the 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 rigors of the day to day, get stuck in things. It's it's hard to uh, to to view the future when you're down in the weeds of today. And so a lot of what AI enables us to do is to start to, to do more, go beyond what we would have been able to do otherwise. Um, so putting on my Microsoft ecosystem hat now, I, I can say that I am genuinely excited about the direction that Microsoft is going by incorporating AI across the board into every one of their products and their solutions. Yes, the sales and marketing out of Microsoft Copilot that that it can be overwhelming. Um, I, I think that there's still Microsoft needs to be careful that they are not trying to get people excited about something that's still in the smoke and mirrors stage of demo. That it's it's great to get people excited about the roadmap, but I I prefer announcements that are based in what is now immediately going into uh, you know, limited trial or, or things that are more real than in six to 12 months, we'll have something like, yeah, get excited um, about something that may or may not come in six months to 12 months. And uh, for people that work in the ISV, the independent software vendor space with the solutions that partner with Microsoft, we hate those announcements because then they usually use the marketing is way ahead of where the products are and it slows down the sales cycle for things that actually exist today. But again, that's a, that's another conversation. Um, but uh, I, but I can say with confidence that in knowing uh, th that the level of change that is going to happen, um, you know, that we know the technology direction, we know, um, you know, the marketing is hyped right now, but we know the direction everything is going. I'm, I'm very confident that we, while we don't understand what the world is going to look like in three to five years, um, we, you know, if we're actively participating and learning that we're, we're going to be much more on top of what's coming and how rapidly things are going to change. Um, there are a lot of negative voices out there about AI and, uh, but I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about the direction that we're going. Uh, I mean, I, as a governance guy, uh, been involved in, in, you know, information management and it governance for my, almost my entire 30 year career. Um, I, I am glad to see that the ethics of AI is at the forefront of a lot of this, that governance of concern for data management is at the forefront of this movement. And I think Microsoft has learned their lessons. They've got their fingers burned at the stove a few times with cool new products, but you know, the admin experience, the governance, compliance, security, we'll, we'll get to that later. Now they're thinking about this stuff up front, which is fantastic. Um, so again, it's all about getting um, time back um, but it's it's also I, I have to say that I also love I'm a fan of the naming of Microsoft Copilot. So it's not the pilot; it doesn't remove the human component. It is your copilot. It's it's there to enhance, to extend, and to enable you to do more without taking on more digital debt. So to wrap things up here. Um, I believe that digital debt is a pressing challenge in today's workplace. It consumes a pretty significant portion of employee time. It hinders innovation. But by leveraging AI, employees can better manage their digital debt. They can maximize their productivity and focus on creative and strategic tasks, which is what I've been talking about. Building AI aptitude. That's the key, folks. You need to get out there, experiment, pilot, try things out. Not that you think this is that's the thing that's going to change your world, um, but just to understand how the tools work, what kind of 
data cleanup that you need to do, the, the, the permissions management around like who has access, is the right access to data? Are we sharing? Are we secure? Are we optimized? Are we, you know, are we sharing, oversharing of content? Are we putting ourselves at risk with external users, external guests within our system? Kind of all of those topics around that, that information architectures, the security, compliance, and governance are critical to moving forward rapidly with AI. Um, so we need to have that aptitude. We need to be able to, and, and, and it, the, the more people are up to date on the latest AI products and solutions, um, the better that they're going to be to realize the full potential of AI inside your organization. Um, so organizations need to be investing in their workforce's continuous learning and development around AI. It definitely digitization has downsides uh, that increase stress, burnout, all those things. Um, but with a balanced approach, checking in with your employees on a regular basis, letting it organically grow. Like I love the idea of building a champions program around AI, the people that are passionate about it and are good at and love sharing what they're learning with their peers. It will dramatically speed up the process of that uh, adoption and uh, um, uh, the learning process inside your organization. Um, as Microsoft's optimistic view suggests, AI can be used to empower employees by reducing the burden of digital debt and giving them back valuable time. The real key here, though, is uh, to successfully navigating the challenges of digital debt and harnessing the power of AI. Uh, it lies in that understanding of the potential of these technologies and fostering that AI aptitude. Can't I made this point several times already, um, but we. You know, we need to experiment, pilot new tools and processes, and then iterate on what we're learning. It's never going to be right first time. Iterate, build that that change management model into your organizational culture, so people aren't afraid of trying things, breaking things here and there, um, but moving things forward, improving overall. By doing so, organizations can enhance workplace productivity, drive innovation, and create a more fulfilling work environment for their employees. One thing I tell clients, I tell partners I've written about over the last 30 years again and again, organizations that are good at recognizing and uh, recognizing new technology and innovation, like the potential for that, and moving very quickly to change, to adapt to those new technologies, like that is a skill set that is a major, uh, uh, you know, a major, if you have it part of your culture, uh, it's a competitive advantage. You will outperform your direct competitors if you are able to more quickly and more thoroughly adapt to the changes that are coming and embrace the new technology. So, uh, you know, with that, just to wrap up, you know, thank you everybody for listening. Um, I, I've had increasingly a lot of AI focused topics on the podcast, and I think it's just where you know, where we've gone. I've, I've had AI since the launch of this podcast was it five, six years ago. Um, AI has been a regular topic, but now it's just kind of the dominant topic on here. It is so important to overall collaboration, which is my lifetime passion um, is collaboration technology. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. If you have any feedback on this, if you have any questions of other topics that you'd like to hear on the show, other guests that you can suggest, I'm always looking for guests. Um, and again, the collab talk podcast is published every Thursday. Um, and that's where it's the broader, uh, you know, collaboration topics. I also, every Monday it's MVP Monday. I do my MVP buzz chat interviews. Um, so that's a much smaller audience, but if you have uh, any interest in, uh, in the Microsoft MVP program, what it's like to be an MVP, what various MVPs are working on, kind of their their paths, like I say, their origin stories to becoming an MVP, you want to learn about that and get involved in the Microsoft ecosystem, it's a great podcast to listen to. So that's every Monday. But the Collab Talk podcast uh, that that's my uh, meat and potatoes of podcasts. So uh, definitely uh, subscribe if you haven't already and follow me out on YouTube as well. Just go to youtube.com whack 
um, at Buckley Planet or at Collab Talk. Either one will find your way over there. So thanks a lot. Have a great night. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.